Um, this is our third annual gala. Um, we appreciate your attendance and support tonight for Cash Valley for Hope Cancer Foundation. <clears throat> As Steve mentioned, about three years ago I was diagnosed with cancer. Um, it was quite an experience to go through the emotions and the uh, roller coaster of what's next, who do you tell, how do you react, what's going to happen. Um, and at this time I thank my wife and my family for their support and for giving me another opportunity to stay here and to do something and that's why I had this impression that I needed to start something to give something back. As I sat in the uh, cancer center, I went every day for about four or five hours a day for my treatments and I would sit with all different kinds of people with different kinds of cancers with all different situations and I would listen to um, their stories and their situations and notice that one of the most resounding problems that all of them had was how am I going to make my house payment? How am I going to make my car payment? How am I going to have food? How am I going to make and meet those day-to-day -day monthly expenses when I'm sick, I can't work, my husband or my spouse can't work? Um, the medical bills were large and huge at times, but it wasn't as <clears throat> stressful on them as it was, am I going to lose my house? Am I going to have a car to drive to get my chemotherapy? Am I going to be able to afford to go travel somewhere for treatments because my insurance won't pay for it? There's various issues that they were having and so that's what we decided to do was focus first off in Cache Valley. So all of the money that you donate stays right here in Cache Valley. We aren't trying to save the world. We're just going to try and make a dent in helping people here. All of the people that work with us on our board and that do day-to-day -day tasks are completely volunteer. There's not one person that receives any compensation or any money for what they do. And I can say right now that we're at about 95 cents on every dollar that's donated comes right back to the people. So I'm, my goal is to get that at 100% if I possibly can, which is difficult, but I'm going to get it done at some point. And while we're on that, <clears throat> I just wanted to recognize really quickly our board of directors. And if they could just stand wherever they may be, and I just introduce them really quick. We've got uh, Tyler and Laura Vanderbeek, just give them a wave. My uh, my daughter Tori, my daughter Mallory, my wife Connie, Richard Thurston, and my other daughter Shanae. <laughs> Heidi and Brett Bullock, right here, and my. <laughs> My mystery man, Charles Parson, which I, I, I told him I was going to make him stand up and he left. So, <laughs> and I, I thank all of them for their dedicated service and help in doing this. This is quite a task to pull one of these off and I appreciate their help. Um, I wanted to thank real briefly also the people that are helping and sponsoring our event. We started out in, in all of your tables. There are flowers, decorations that were done by Elise Berry. Elise is one of our families. She and Bob are back in the back. Um, we met them early in the organization's beginnings and um, unfortunately we lost um, their daughter to cancer but they have been a supporter and a help to us and we hope that we were uh, helpful in their battle at that time. Also, Lewiston State Bank, who is our title sponsor for their um, support in helping give up Steve Edwards for a couple of months at least. 
most people ask me, what does Steve really do? And, yeah, and Anthony, his boss, is still trying to figure out, what does he do? Well, for the last couple of months, he's been helping promote and do this. So hopefully that compensates for uh, what he does. Um, great Harvest, Brad, James, um, Lauer Foods, Alan Lauer, Schreiber Foods, the Herald Journal, the Cash Valley Media Group, Elements, Mac in the back that cuts your meat, and Jonathan at <clears throat> Lee's Marketplace were all local businesses that donated and helped to make this so that we could be profitable. And I thank all of them for their support this year and what they did for our gala here. I wanted to just take a, a quick moment and thank um, Jason Allen. I don't know how many of you knew that we did a little quick promo. Jason rode in the Logan to Jackson bike race and he raised $3,200 for Cash Valley for Hope. <laughs> Jason, come on. Come on up. So I wanted to present Jason with a uh, Cash Valley for Hope biking jersey, which we were hoping that we would have had when there you go when he went on the race. But a typhoon hit the factory in the Philippines and knocked it out, and we didn't get him until yesterday. So, Jason, thank you for your help. We're going to start taking pledges right now. Jason went 170 miles on that race. He's 89 years old. <laughs> and he said, I hit 170 and it was gone. There was just nothing left. But I really think if we can give from 3,200 to 10,000, he'll make it the 206 miles. So keep that in mind when we bring that up to see if we can help motivate him. I've got a better idea. Next year, <laughs> if we all make a pledge so much per mile, how about you and Stu on a tandem? <laughs> What do you say, coach? <laughs> okay, let's start training. Map my ride with Coach Morrill. <laughs> Probably three quarters of a mile the first time, right? Yeah, and I'll do half of that and you do the other half. Um, finally, just, then there's a lot of people to thank and a lot of things to do. Those jerseys, by the way, are available for you bikers, can't. Um, some of you guys that bike, we'd love to have you helping support and promote uh, Cash Valley for Hope when you're in a bike race out uh, as you came in. They're available for a $100 donation. Also, uh, Larry Wimborg, who has painted two original paintings for us the last couple of years. We gave him a year off. His two original paintings are also available out there if you're interested in having one of those. And the proceeds from those sales come back to Cash Valley for Hope. Um, finally, just wanted to recognize our families that are here, the ones that are why we do this. So I think you know who you are. If you'd stand up, we would just want to recognize our families and survivors and fighters that are battling and fighting every day for and through this. It's uh, one of the real benefits of being able to do this is to meet these individuals and I do call them family because they become that way and to watch their battle and to watch them fight through this which they all do. Some days it's tough. I could tell you a lot of stories but Stu's got to get done by 8.30 so I'm going to wrap it up. So thank you once again for coming. We very much appreciate your support. We'll now like to just hear two quick stories from two of our family members. First from Mary Davison, and she'll be followed by Eileen Johnson.
Getting up in front of a lot of people is not a strong point of mine. My name is Mary Davison. I um, was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma in March, two months after my fourth child was born. Um, and really at a point in my life where I felt like nothing could get, it couldn't get any worse than it was. My husband was in school full time and um, we really didn't know how we would be able to make it. And um, we found out through the cancer center of, about Cash Valley for Hope. And we are so grateful for the help that they gave us. We had our little rusty van was our only vehicle and it needed a lot of help. And we were able to, or Cash Valley for Hope was able to help us get that running a little bit better so that we could, I could get two from my treatments. And um, my husband, because we had four young, we have four young children, our oldest is six, and then a three-year-old, a two-year-old, and a nine-month-old. Um, he did, was not employed so that he could help me. And we appreciate so much the, the ability for him to be able to help me through your donations. And um, we really couldn't have done it without this foundation. And it, it's comforting to be able to hear other people's stories and know that I'm not the only one going through this. But we appreciate so much what was done for us. We could not have done it without the help of your donations. Thank you. My name is Eileen Johnson, and um, we first, well, I first heard about the Cash Valley for Hope about a year ago on the radio, actually. Um, we have had um, cancer as a companion for our family for about seven years, um, and I didn't think that it was a program that would be available for us. Um, um, the last, my son um, was diagnosed with melanoma when he was 13. Um, he was serving a mission in Scotland and it returned and so he had to come home and we were um, given the news that he was re-diagnosed with that. Um, and my friends kind of rallied around us and said, you know, we've seen your family go through a lot. Um, on top of cancer, we've had preemie babies in the NICU, and so our family is not a stranger to um, medical bills. It's kind of a normal for us. And um, so my friends rallied around us and said, um, we're gonna do a fundraiser for your family. We can't sit idle anymore. We need to jump in and help. Um, about on the day of the fundraiser, one of the girls came to me and she said, I've nominated your family for Cash Valley for Hope. And I really did not know what that meant. And then um, we had some people come to the fundraiser um, who were involved with Cash Valley for Hope. And um, my boys have been friends with their girls for a long time. And he said, you're going to be getting a call from Roger Welsh for Cash Valley for Hope. By the time he said that, my phone rang and it was Roger. And I was so amazed at this foundation because um, we're like many of you. We're just an average family, um, just getting along. And I didn't think that there were programs available for our type of family. Um, and I think that's one of the really unique things about Cash Valley for Hope because um, they kind of stepped in and made things so much more doable. Um, we've, we've gone through a lot and um, it affects every member of your family. And as parents, you want to fix everything and 
you also want your other children to feel okay about things. And um, when they explained to us what the foundation was about, um, I really can't explain the sense of relief that came to me. Um, things always have a way of working out, but this was a type of relief that we had not ever experienced before, and it freed up a lot of energy to be able to then focus on our son's treatment and to be able to focus on our family. Um, that allowed us to go to bed with one less worry on our mind. And um, every month, whether we have needed help or not, we're always contacted by Roger. And to feel like someone has your back um, is really an incredible gift. And so I just really want to thank all of you for your time and your donation because um, cancer doesn't play fair. And I had one gentleman say to one of my friends, said, well, why do they need help? Um, don't they have insurance? And when you go through cancer, you understand that uh, cancer involves a lot more than just having insurance, as Roger pointed out. And so I, the only thing I can say is thank you. It seems inadequate, but it has allowed us to have a sense of peace and a sense of relief in a uncertain time. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mary and Eileen. I know that's not the easiest thing to do. It's emotional and tough, but we appreciate sharing your story so that people get kind of an idea of what goes on in our lives when we deal with this. Once again, just thanking um, Lewiston State Bank, Great Harvest, Lauer Foods, RSM Food Services, Schreiber's, The Herald Journal, the Cash Valley Media Group, Elements, Lee's Marketplace, and the Valley Channel, who's there videoing for us, um, for their help, for sponsoring and helping us do this. Um, I will now turn some time back to Steve. Coach, hang on. Here we go, buddy. Thanks. Let's have a round of applause for Roger. Roger's a busy man. He is running a business. He's a grandfather. He's a father. He's a friend. He has other responsibilities and he spends somewhere between 12 to 15 hours a week with Fat Cap, uh, Cash Valley for Hope. And the work he has done is felt throughout the community and we're grateful for that. He's also living proof that behind every successful man there's a surprised mother-in-law. Uh, <laughs> was she Connie? She, Connie's agreeing with me, so must must be true. Vicky, true? All right. This was the hardest part. I've laid awake wondering what we were going to do right now, where we go through an emotional and, and uh, sensitive testimonies, where we hear from those who have benefited, and you start to understand the real purpose of the Foundation for Hope. And as Roger said, this is our third one we've done of, the, done of these. And last winter we were talking about what we might do this year, and I said, you know, we need to do something else. We need to do something that we can get a broader group of people here that can find out about the Foundation, that can get involved, and really know what's going on. And he says, well, what's your ideas? And I said, well, I don't have one, but let me think about it. And somewhere in the back of my mind, I'd always had to just be fun to get Stu up here and roast him. <laughs> Part of healing is laughter, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to have some laughs. We're going to have some good times. I talked to players. There were a lot of guys that wanted to do this, Stu. <laughs> I talked to associates. I talked to some uh, BYU fans that sit on the fifth row right behind your bench. 
<laughs> and I talked to John Neal. John Neal's a former player, and he says, you know what you need to do is it's kind of a redneck type thing. And I said, what do you mean, John? And he says, you might have been an Aggie basketball player if. I said, well, send me some stuff. Now, Nate's here, and there's some former players, and they, will, might, might, they might get the inside joke of this a little bit better, but John Neal said, your playbook was thicker than your corporate finance textbook and required an engineering degree to understand it. <laughs> now, you've seen the cards down on the bench. Those of you have been there, and you've seen the file system. That, that must be the best file system, because those coaches can pull those plays up that quick. He says, now, we're getting a brand new facility up there, a practice facility, which Stu is so excited about because when that is built, he never has to go to the hyper building again. And John said practicing in the hyper was synonymous with getting yelled at for two hours. And if you've been over in the hyper and played ball, you know exactly what he's talking about. He said you still wake up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat from a nightmare about setting a weak, a weak screen and being compared to Charmin toilet paper. <laughs> Now, you might all understand this one, because it affects all of you. Your team won 23 games in a conference championship, and your fans called it a rebuilding year. <laughs> and then he said, you've got to play for the best coaches and program in the country, and are a better husband, father, and person because of it. And that's the way a lot of players that I know feel about Stu and having played for him. But then that's not why we're here tonight. Okay. Our first speaker will be Stu's son, Jesse Morrill. Well, I was really excited to have the opportunity to come here tonight. First of all, for the, uh, the wonderful cause that we're all here for. Um, as, as many of you know, we dealt with uh, cancer in our family with my mother. Um, and thankfully, she's doing really well now, and we're all very grateful for that. Um, but we've also dealt with fam uh, uh, cancer throughout our extended family as well. We understand the impact that that has on families and people. And, um, and this is just a wonderful cause, so I'm really happy to be here for that. Um, the other reason I was excited to be here was to be able to talk about my dad in front of a large group of people. And uh, I know this is supposed to be a roast, but I have to start with some words of appreciation. Um, most of you, some of you may know our family story, but when I was a baby, my dad died in a construction accident. And my mom was pregnant with my brother at the time, and we were fatherless for uh, at least the first uh, you know, three years of my life. And when my mom uh, married my dad now, he adopted us right away, right after they got married. And as I've grown up and, and grown older, I've come to understand the, the commitment that, that he made to us and, uh, and what that meant and how big of a deal that was. And, uh, and he was an unbelievable father. Um, my parents had two, two girls after uh, they were married, and not one time did I ever feel like we were, we were being treated any differently than, than the two girls that were his own flesh and blood. So um, my appreciation grows every day for that. And uh, I wanted to, again, take this opportunity to uh, recognize him for what he did for us. So round of applause. So with that being said, he didn't always use the best judgment <laughs> when taking care of us. One of, the, uh, one of my favorite stories is uh, there was a time when mom and the girls were out of town. I don't know why we didn't go with, I'm not sure what the reason was, but uh, we spent about five days, I think, with dad, my brother and I. And uh, we were, it was in the summer, and so we didn't have school, and he was having to work, and so we went to, we went to work with him a lot, and we kind of treated Dahlberg Arena as our personal playground, and we, uh, and this was in Missoula, so that's where the, the Grizzlies play in Dahlberg Arena. 
And I think he probably decided that we were getting a little too into uh, some of the nooks and crannies at Dahlberg Arena and decided one evening that maybe he should go to work and leave us at home. And we were, I think, seven and eight, probably not quite old enough to be home by ourselves. But he came up with a foolproof plan. And he said, guys, you stay in the basement, watch TV. I'm going to call you. You let the phone ring six times, but don't answer it. Then I'm going to call back, let it ring two more times, and then answer the phone. We had a code. We were ready to go. So we were watching TV. The phone rang. Alan and I scampered over, and uh, we went through the code, but got, got through our six rings, got through our two rings, answered it, said, you guys all right? He said, yeah. And then we went back to our thing. So we survived it. I was very mature for my age, I think, at eight, so I'm sure he felt very comfortable with me <laughs> being at home there. And uh, I can tell mom is wishing I wouldn't have told that story now. But I'm pretty sure that he was taking advice from Coach Selvig at the time, and he can, he can speak to that when he comes up here. Um, I, I learned a lot of things from dad, um, a, lot of, a lot about hard work, um, being prepared, um, and about being a good person who does things the right way. Um, one thing, though, that people often say about me is they talk about I have a calm demeanor and I'm fairly patient. And I don't think I got that from dad. I'm not, that, that's, uh, you know, people who have been around, if you've watched him coach, if you've watched him pretty much do anything in life, I'm not sure you would say patience was a, is an attribute. But the next story here um, talks a little bit about one of, his, I think was one of his more patient moments. So we were, um, we were at the final four, actually. I, I met dad in Indianapolis for the final four, and we had a great time there. Uh, it was the year that George Mason went, and so it was a lot of fun. I don't remember a whole lot else about the final four because it pretty much got trumped by trying to get back home, which is where the story begins. So we were going, we went to the Indianapolis airport, and uh, we were leaving on a Sunday. We were supposed to get back to, to Denver together, and uh, we had a, a one-year-old birthday to attend. Nicole's son was turning one, so it was a big deal. And uh, we got to the airport early, or late morning, I'd say, and found out pretty early on that our flight was delayed. It had a mechanical, mechanical issue, and so we were, we were going to be waiting a little bit. So we knew that we, they gave us some food vouchers, which we appreciated. We went to, uh, I think it was called Dick Clark's in the airport, and had, had our first meal there. It was delicious. And then we came back and found out that our flight was going to be later that evening. So we were, we were waiting for the flight, um, kind of hanging out in the airport, and the, the skies got really dark and a storm was coming through, and it ended up being a tornado that went, went through Indianapolis, a, like a small tornado. So we got evacuated, we were into the tornado safe zone, and of course they let us know that all flights were grounded at that point. So we were uh, given hotel rooms and told to come back in the morning. So we knew at that point we were probably missing the birthday party, but we thought maybe we'd get on the flight early in the morning the next day and we'd be able to get to Denver. So, uh, so we come back the next morning, and we go through an incredible, incredibly long line. Again, Dad's doing pretty well at this point. Patience level is pretty good, and he's handling it well. He probably would, would like to have some choice words with the tornado, but I, don't, I think he knew he wasn't going to have that option. So we, uh, so we get through the line, and we get up, and now there's a huge line that you have to stand in just to find out about the status of your flight. And it was easily an hour and a half that we're standing in this line. We finally get up to the front and the lady tells us, we say, well, she, she asks us where our, what our destination is. We say, well, we're going to Denver. And she said, well, it's, it's good news for you because we have a special flight we're putting together for you to get to Denver tonight. We said, great. So we, she said, Look, take, take our names down. Said, we'll call you up here when we have details on the special flight. And we said, great. And she said, here's some food vouchers. And uh, we headed to Dick Clark's. Had another meal at Dick Clark's. Not quite as good as the first time, but still pretty good. So uh, we come back out. And now we're, we're waiting again for a while. And haven't really heard anything. We're, we're, pretty, we're still pretty, uh, pretty certain about our flight. We're excited about it. Um, some other people are getting a little bit edgy and they're, and they're desperate. They're trying to get out of there. So they're coming up and telling us, hey, we're renting a car. 
Um, we're going to take a bus here. Do you want to share a taxi with us? Uh, Coach Durier and Coach Verlin got a hold of a tandem bike and just started pedaling. <laughs> People were getting out of there, but we said, we said, oh, those poor guys, it's too bad they don't have a special flight. Because we've got a special flight to Denver. So, so we keep waiting. And uh, at this point, we start to get pretty comfortable because we've been there a long time. So we're, our shoes are off and, and we're just sitting there. And uh, all of a sudden, Dad, he just starts growling. And I'm, he's sitting next to me. I'm not sure what's going on, but he's digging through his briefcase and he's, he's upset. And I'm thinking, did he lose his wallet? What are we looking at? Well, then he just says, banana. There's a rotten banana that had gotten left in there, smashed all over his brief face. It was terrible. And he just gets up with his socks on, goes to the bathroom. I mean, it was, it was maybe rock bottom at that point, but the, the patience level was definitely starting to dwindle. So now we start to, to get a little concerned because nobody around us that was on our original flight is there. There's still a huge line. And we haven't heard about our special flight yet, so we decide we're going to have to get back in line and, uh, and, try and, and get some information. So we go through the line again another hour, and uh, we get up to the front finally, and we say, you know, we're just checking on the, on the status of our special flight to Denver. And the guy at the, at the desk kind of looks at us, and he's... He starts typing, and he says, well, who told you about the flight to Denver? And we said, well, it was a woman, dark-haired lady this morning. She told us about the flight. And he said, he said oh, that's my manager. And uh, I'm sorry, but I think my manager lied to you. <laughs> <laughs> and that was where patience was now gone. So uh, <laughs> he didn't even try and help her out. He just, she just lied to us, apparently. So dad had some choice words at this point, and he was giving him now the referee treatment, I would say. Um, a lot of uh, lied to us. You're just going to lie to us? How, do you, how are you just going to lie to us? So he, he was getting it. But this guy was great. He just he zoned in. He was typing. Food vouchers were flying. <laughs> and before we were done, we had a flight to Chicago late at night and another meal at Dick Clark's. So we went back to Dick Clark's. Again, food not nearly as good at this point, but we had a lot of vouchers, so we, uh, we stocked up. Uh, we did get on our flight to, uh, to Chicago late at night, got in. Thankfully, they gave us our own hotel rooms because Dick Clark had done his damage, and we needed separate rooms at that point. And uh, got up in the morning, and we had a first-class flight to Denver, and, uh, and we finally made it home. And I've been telling the story ever since, and it gets bigger and better every time I tell it. So. <laughs> So again, thank you very much for, uh, for being here tonight and enjoy the rest of the evening. One of the highlights that I've had is getting to know Stu's mom. She was a great woman and she used to come down and sit right on that front row, right behind the bench. And I don't know if that was good or not, but Stu had reached one of those rock bottom points that Jesse was talking about with the referees one night. And uh, we thought Mike Williams better get the defibrillators ready. And, uh, and I'm getting done at the game and I walk out and she grabs me and she says, Steve, you gotta go talk to Stu. He can't get upset like that. And I said, well, that's not really, and I'm not gonna talk to him. <laughs> uh, I said, those guys over there, those assistants, they're the ones that's supposed to talk to him. And I said, in fact, I think you're the only one that could even talk to him. So you better, that's your job. Don't talk, pan out off me. But his mother was a wonderful woman. Our next speaker is uh, Craig Drury. Craig is a high school teammate of Stu's at Provo. Uh, that school, one of those high schools down there. <laughs> Craig's still there. I don't know if he graduated yet or not, but he's, uh, he's a legend in high school basketball and has done real, uh, agreed to come up here and talk about his friend, Craig. I feel honored to be here for my friend and talk about him and talk to you people who know him in ways that I don't probably and I probably know him in ways that you don't 
you know, it's, it's uh, I, I told Stu I would be the shortest speaker here, and I'm going to hold to that, Stu. But I have a few choice things I would like to show you. You know, and this board over here is, is blank, but I'm going to turn it around and let you look at it. This is, this is my high school teammate. Gary, you remember this guy? This, this is the nice pitcher. <laughs> you know, I've been coaching for a long time myself, and my high school guys tease us about the short pants and the buckles that we wore on our pants. Well, this one, I, had, I found a little teeny picture in our archives that shows Stu in a nice pair of short pants. And so I had to, I had to bring this one. I'm going to leave this with Stu, so I hope Vicky will post it somewhere so people can see it really well. That's, you know, they had to, this is in the newspaper, and you know, newspapers, even today are not as the greatest pitchers, but back in with the 30s when Stu and I played, <laughs> they were the pitchers were even worse. And, and this has got a buckle on it, you know, the belt. And Gary, did you have those when you played? I don't remember, you know. But Stu was a you know a big big boy, wore number 42. And just so Stu didn't feel too bad, I had to bring one, the last one, when he and I were seniors, and we were, we were captains together on the football team and the basketball team, and they came over and took a dual picture of us. Stu was down as a center. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, I was standing above, there's a football in that picture somewhere. But boy, we were studs, weren't we at that time? <laughs> So, uh, you know, one thing uh, about Stu, you know, we were, we were basketball players, but we were football players back in the days when guys played more than one sport. They hardly do that anymore. And I think Stu had more offers to play football than basketball, or at least as many. He was a heck of a football player and probably would have played in the NFL if, they would, if he would have gone that direction. But, um, you know... I appreciated Jesse that that story of, of patience that you that you told. He was um, oh, I know Stu in some ways that he was the big guy that was nice and kind to everybody in high school. I don't recognize the guy swearing on the sideline when I watch the games. <laughs> I, I just don't know him because I remember the guy that uh, we were standing in the hall and there, there was a dance coming up and we had dates because we were. You know, supposed to get dates. Stu didn't have one. <laughs> Stu wasn't thinking about going to the dance. And we found out there was this young lady that was kind of one of our group, and she didn't have a, a date either. And I don't remember which one of our buddies said it, but she walked down the hall, and, and one of our guys said, Hey, Stu, uh, or hey, Ann, I think her name was Ann, Ann, uh, who are you going to the dance with? And she kind of got embarrassed and didn't have a date. And we said, Well, Stu doesn't have a date, and he wanted to ask you. <laughs> so she walks over and say, I get, he took her to the dance. I don't remember everything, anything after that, but it was, she was a lucky girl. She was a lucky girl. <laughs> well, Stu probably said three or four words in the whole day to fire know him. You know, uh, another story that I remember, you know, Stu was, when you went somewhere with Stu, you drove. I don't know if that's still the case. We didn't let him drive. <laughs> he was he had a car, I think it was an old Mercury or Lincoln or something, and, and it was a big old car. Like I said, it was back in the 30s or 40s when we went to school, and it was this huge, huge tank of a car, but the front seat was really, really low. And you know, so Stu sat in it at six foot seven and two hundred and something pounds. He just looked like a normal guy. And uh, one of our buddies was telling me when he, he was driving somewhere and cut somebody off. You know, I come from, oh, I don't even still want to say this, I come from Cougar territory. <laughs> and it was one of those BYU students that, you know, were so kind and nice. 
But I guess, uh, you know, I, I have to, I'm telling him, I'm relating this from a friend of mine that I talked to. And they said, this guy was upset. I don't know how bad Stu cut him off. And he pulled up and motioned Stu to get over. He wanted to talk with him, you know, in some way. And so Stu pulls the car, um, car over. And the guy pulls over behind him and he jumps out of the car and he's going to walk and make something to do with this guy. And Stu unfolds from the, from the car. You know, he's six foot seven, 230 some pounds at the time. The guy got halfway to the car and said, Oh, excuse me, I made a mistake and walked back. <laughs> so, well, you know, the stories I have of Stu are kind of like that. They're good, positive stories. This was a good man. Uh, and he was a good, good friend. He's the best man at my wedding. My wife uh, knew him. He and I went to see, you know, three of us went to school together. And I have nothing negative to say about this man other than I love him dearly. And I am so proud of the job that Bulldog is doing here in my hometown. Uh, most of you probably don't know, I was born in Preston, Idaho. My mother's from Lewiston. I'm a Drury by name, but I'm a Hilliard and a Heyer and a Gilbert and a lot of those other names that are up here in Cache Valley. So thank you, Stu. I'm the shortest speaker, I hope. Nothing like old high school friends. Uh, I talked to some other sp uh, players. Spencer Nelson apologized for what he did on your shoes at the game in Boise. That's kind of an inside deal there too. J.C. Carroll wishes that you would have run a few more plays for him to shoot. <laughs> Desmond Pinneger wants to know if he can come back. He has a year of eligibility left on defense. <laughs> Brennan Ray wants a chance to set a pick on Bob Thomason. And uh, that's, that's an inside one too. So we'll guess. The Big West coaches got tired of your managers asking for brooms being part of the standard equipment in the visitor's locker room in the Big West. And Gary Wilkinson, he's here tonight. He said that there was a time in practice where JC was tying his shoe and Stu was kind of upset with the team. There's a theme starting here, Stu. And he got talking and talking. Well, Stu, JC was down tying his shoe, and Stu backed up and tripped right over the back of him and went falling on the floor. And he said, We were all sat there, we were so scared to laugh, none of us even cracked a smile. <laughs> And he said it took him three months for anybody on the team or him, anybody could laugh, but they are now. <laughs> and I talked to Jared Quayle, and Jared said nothing. He's, he's scared, still scared to talk to you, Stu. <laughs> Our next speaker, Skip Molitor. Skip uh, went down and picked him up at the airport today, and we had a great ride home. Uh, you get me and Skip together with basketball and golf, and the trip was pretty pretty quick. I ended up getting talking to him so bad I <laughs> came right up 89 and before we knew it. Skip was a teammate at Gonzaga with Stu. He was a assistant coach at Montana and at Colorado State and best man at their wedding and uh, now he's the golf coach at Whitman College in Walla Walla, Washington. What a retirement. Tony, this is the first time I've seen you. Great, great to see you. So, uh, pleasure to be here. And uh, Steve, thanks for coming up and, and picking me up. And I felt right at home when you made that wrong turn. I'm kind of known for uh, doing a little bit, bit of that myself. Um, and then Roger just wanted to, uh, where is Roger? Just, just, just wanted to uh, thank you for this wonderful work that you're doing. And, and uh, you know, this, this opponent that we have in cancer has, has touched, I'm sure, everybody in the room. And uh, one of, one of uh, Stu's, my good friends at uh, Gonzaga University, is one of my golf teammates, uh, passed away last year from a battle in, with cancer, brain cancer. And uh, so it's just uh, wonderful to, to see you reach out to these families in need. So thank you very much. Um, so kind of an interesting symmetry. You're starting with uh, Provo, and, and uh, so Stu spent 18 years there, and he's been here about what, almost the same amount of time, 16 years. Uh, so I'm hoping to fill in some of the gaps between, uh, between Utah. And so, uh, and, and so, you know, Stu, uh, I, was, I was privileged to be his teammate up at Gonzaga University. And the, the theme that I want to start on, and it kind of gets uh, 
Craig, it kind of deals a little bit with that nice guy that you used to play with. And I, I played with a pretty nice guy for a couple of years at Gonzaga. Uh, and at lunch today, Stu made the comment. He says, you know, Vicky mentioned, uh, you know, I married a really nice guy. <laughs> Implied. What happened? Well, I, I might be able to fill in some of those uh, some of those blanks. So, uh, the theme I want to start on is: imagine what it would be like for Stu Morrill now to coach Stu Morrill then, and uh, and so you know all all, uh, all coaching starts with recruiting. And when Stu was recruited to Gonzaga University, first uh, there was something pretty obvious there. You've got somebody from Rick's Junior College being recruited to a, to a Catholic campus. And his, uh, Adrian von Christiani did a heck of a recruiting job and said, Stu, don't, you know, don't worry a bit about this uh, Catholic thing. You, you won't even notice, you know, notice the difference between that and a public school. And, and sure enough, first, uh, first class Stu walks into, there's a gray-haired Jesuit with a big old white collar who's teaching ethics and, and philosophy and, and logic. And uh, he, he, got a, he got an idea of, uh, uh, of what recruiting is like and the latitude that coaches use when they recruit a player. Um, now, I, I, just, uh, I just read this yesterday. I didn't realize this. Uh, uh, Stu and I also lost a, a good friend by the name of Greg Sten here a few years ago. Uh, and I did not know, Sten was a Jewish kid from San Francisco. Did you know that? And so uh, I, I read in, in, in uh, the article on Greg, uh, when he was a Jewish kid come showing up to Gonzaga to play, he didn't know it was a Catholic school. So. <laughs> So the, the Jesuits are getting a lot better of at least uh, mentioning that, uh, that it is a Catholic school. Now another, another part of recruiting, and Nate, Nate I'm sure you can, you can uh, relate to this. So how would Stu Morrill, the coach at Utah State University, uh, deal with this recruit? And so Adrian's recruiting Stu, and Stu's pretty interested in Gonzaga, and he says, but uh, okay, I'm getting pretty close to signing on the dotted line here, but I gotta come down and, and hunt with my brother Gary in the Wasatch. And so, <laughs> and so the second, third week of practice, you know, where our teammates are showing up and we're looking around and you know, where's the, where's the big guy, where's Stu? And Adrian kind of mumbles, oh, he's, he's hunting. So what, what? He's what? He's hunting with his brother down in the Wasatch. Gary, I'm sure you remember that trip. And, uh, and so if you could only imagine Stu at this stage sitting down with a recruit, recruit that says, okay, coach, uh, I'm going to go hunting the third weekend. <laughs> I think at lunch today you mentioned some kid who wanted Sunday off, and you'd think the guy, <laughs> think the guy was asking for something extraordinary. <laughs> and so, uh, so once we did get him there, so so we finally got the guy recruited. And now it's time to to see if he can play a little bit, and uh, and so. Stu, at this stage of the game, is a, a, just a tad bit set in his ways. And, uh, and so, you know, he's not real open to, to, to players who want to have discussions in terms of things like playing time or role or things are, are very specific. Well, the Stu moral then, uh, and so he's breaking into, uh, breaking into a new system. And I remember one very heated interchange between Stu and, and his coach. And uh, what a wonderful guy, uh, and, and he was learning the ropes and coaching, but uh, Stu came off the floor and he wasn't real pleased with what, what, what was taking place out there. And, and he sits down and Adrian says something to him and he grabs his jersey and he says, you can take this jersey, I don't want to play for you. <laughs> and, and so, now, God love Adrian. Uh, now, when all said and done, Adrian asks Stu to be his assistant coach. And when all said and done, uh, this is a wonderful relationship that really brings out the best in, in Stu and in Gonzaga basketball. Uh, but can you imagine a, a player coming off the coach right now at Utah State? <laughs> And telling Stu, <laughs> uh, that would not fly. <laughs> you know, another, uh, a couple other things that were interesting as a, as a teammate of Stu's, you know, if you watch Stu's teams play, they have remarkable execution, remar remarkable shot selection. 
Um, well, the hard thing about Stu is he, uh, this is back in the day, not of the jump hook, this is back in the day of the step hook, and he, he could shoot a step hook with both the left and the right hand. And he was a big guy, as you could tell, you know, he's uh, not, not quite as slim, slim as he was back then, but Stu, one of his strengths was he could run like an absolute deer. He was also one of our best perimeter shooters. Well, that all becomes kind of a challenge for a coach who's trying to get a team to take good shots every time down the floor. And so, uh, I don't know if, uh, I, I would guess that there would be, well, Bo probably recognizes this from the, the playing days at, at uh, when he was at Montana and we were at Gonzaga. But when Stu was open, uh, he, he, had, he has all these signals as a coach now. He's got the playbook and he's got every signal. Well, I've always been amazed that this, that this signal was not in there. But when Stu was open, I was a point guard and I'm on the perimeter and I've got the ball. And what I'd see inside is this. <laughs> it, was, it was always three claps, all right? And then, then this big old... Now, one of the things that made Stu and I pretty good friends was I couldn't shoot a lick. And so, <laughs> so it wasn't a big deal to me to give it up. Uh, but then you got Adrian sitting over there on the side. He wants good shots, and, and here's the big guy who's always open. And he catches it, and it might be a right-hand hook, it might be a left-hand hook, he might step out to the perimeter and shoot it from out there. Uh, and so fortunately, he made a very high percentage of those shots. But uh, I think, Stu, that you would be a challenge for the Stu Moral now to coach the Stu Moral now. <laughs> Uh, a couple things off the court. Probably the most, the most that I was ever chastised uh, was, uh, you know, I, I was Catholic, Stu was Mormon. We had some, uh, some great conversations. And, uh, you know, we, we probably had some off-court activities that they, they didn't do at Rick's College or at uh, BYU at the time. <laughs> and so the end of the season uh, rolls around. And uh, I had never said boo to Stu as far as, hey, let's go have a beer. Never said a word. Uh, then, uh, then I come in, the, the season just ends, and, and I walk into, the, uh, walk into the lobby of the dorm, and didn't, didn't, uh, didn't say anything. I just said, uh, Stu, what's it going to be? Is it going to be hard stuff, beer, or wine? <laughs> that didn't get quite the chuckle I thought it would. <laughs> Well, anyway, he, uh, he, he, his answer at the time, I won't even tell you his answer, but I will tell you this. I got called into the coach's office the next day, and you would think that I had done the worst thing that had ever been done at Gonzaga Basketball. So I promised his mom this, and I promised his dad this. <laughs> And he, he didn't care what I did. It was just, how could you let Stu even think about doing something like that? So, but then, uh, so we, we, had, we had a fun run at, at Gonzaga and, and just, a, Robin's coming up next and, and Stu and I unfortunately were, were part of uh, getting the getting Mon University of Montana basketball headed, headed in a very positive direction. Judd Heathcote was their coach. And uh, they were just struggling around long and, and really hadn't done much. And uh, we, had, um, we had beaten the, the Grizzlies at our place and had, had a, got off to a pretty good start our senior year. And we came in, we went to Bozeman and beat the Bobcats. And so we come into Missoula and we're, uh, I think, either first place or tied for first in the league. Uh, the, the, uh, the, we scored the last basket to get within 29 points and it was still the first half. <laughs> and it was just when Montana just took off and they beat us by 30 the, the night before they had Idaho down like 49 to 14 and later that year it was Idaho State uh, had uh, a couple seven footers and a great team and I think tied, tied the Grizzlies for, uh, for the league championships and, and they had them down 37 to 12 if I remember right at, at halftime. So that was really the, the time when Montana and Judd and Robin and, and some important people in the Montana tradition started things going like that. And so it was a lot of fun for Stu uh, a few years later to join Mike Montgomery. And then a few, year, a few years later, I was able to, to join Stu. And then uh, went with him from there to Colorado State University. And, and uh, I left Colorado State 
And uh, this would probably be a, a good time. I, 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 you know, I, I think I'm going to have to forego the Europe stories and throwing tomatoes out of the apartment and uh, jumping in. I, I've got to share one line from Europe. When, when Stu, uh, when I, I got over to Europe, year after we graduated, and I had this great plan as far as, I'll just use Stu's apartment as a home base, and I'll travel here, and I'll travel there. And, and I get over there, and, and Stu was not there for the cultural experience. You know, he wanted to play basketball, get paid, and get back to the States. And uh, it was, he, was, he was a bit impatient by then. And so I got there, and he says, oh, this is just awful. You wouldn't believe what I've got to go. Well, I went in with him the next day. In fact, I've watched him play that night, he played great, went in the next day and watched him get, get paid by the, by the banker. And he goes into a back office and it's kind of seedy in the bank and the guy's, uh, you know, unfortunately the guy's an alcoholic and he's crying and singing the blues and we hang in there until he finally gives Stu the money. <laughs> Which explained when we got back to, the, to, to his apartment why there was like $20,000 sitting in a drawer. But, and so he made the decision, uh, hey, let's just, let's just buy a little used car and we're out of here. So we did that. That was the last game he played. Well, the next day in the paper, uh, there was a, a picture, not quite as this flattering, of Stu in the, in the paper, and it was translated loosely, take one look, one last look at this big, beautiful blonde. <laughs> <laughs> you will no longer see him playing in a Bordeaux uniform. So we were off to the races, and, and uh, it, it was a lot of fun. But um, I would like to, uh, to, to end with, uh, so the first, first theme was kind of, you know, how would uh, Stu Morrill, now the coach, uh, recruit and, and uh, coach Stu Morrill, then the player. Uh, well, what I want to end with is, alludes to Jesse's story, which was, was awfully well told as far as if in the last 40 years, if, if anybody has ever asked me, you know, what's your favorite love story of all time? Well, my, my favorite is my mom and dad, and, and on their headstone it, it reads uh, 64 happy years together. Uh, but I would have to say Stu and Vicki are absolutely right, right next to that, and, and, uh, and, it, and it truly was a love story. I was living with Stu when uh, Vicki came back from, from Westby and got back to Montana with the boys, and, and uh, she showed up at practice, and, and uh, I remember Stu coming home, and after he had downed his quart of ice cream, he, uh, he says, uh, he says, ah, I've got to stay away from that Vicky. You know, she's, <laughs> that, just, that just wouldn't be right. <laughs> well, it went from trying to stay away from Vicky, good luck on that one, to, uh, to uh, uh, just a, a, a wonderful romance and, and li literally the, the most lovely love story that I know of beyond my mom and dad. So uh, I want to uh, congratulate their family and the obvious, obviously the wonderful things Stu has done as a basketball coach here. But uh, to hear the, the allusions to being a good person and a, and a good family person, and, and that's really what it's all about. And there's, there were some times in my life, I was single till I was almost 40, and there were some times where Stu kind of had to rein me in and say, no, we got to kind of get back in touch with reality here. <laughs> And uh, I now have a beautiful uh, wife with both, both my daughters are uh, seniors this year, one at Colorado College and one at, uh, one at Walla Walla High School. But, um, and so our family situation is working out very well. But wanted to, to congratulate Stu and Vicki especially and, uh, and just thank, thank God for them and thank them for being part of this wonderful cause. Thank you. Stu, there's a reason we didn't invite, invite your current players tonight. <laughs> we'll now hear from uh, Vicki Morrill. <laughs> now, me and Vicki are friends and it's going to stay that way. <laughs> Our next speaker will be Coach Robin Selvig. He's been at Montana for 35 years coaching. He's uh, entering his 36th season as a women's uh, basketball coach. He's had 33 winning seasons, 28 20 win seasons, 23 conference championships, and 20 NCAA appearances. Coach Selvig. Thank you, Steve. It is very good to be here. It's an honor to be here, and I, and I admire 
this foundation and what you people are doing. Uh, we're involved in something similar in Missoula that helps our community and it's uh, it's just an awesome thing. It, it, uh, when you hear those stories, it makes me feel bad and guilty about worrying about winning a basketball game. But uh, that's what I guess we try and do. But anyway, you have my respect and admiration. Um, my wife came with me, Janie. We're good friends of the Morals for a long time. Glad she was along. But uh, Steve, uh, Steve had gooped up our reservations, ended up putting us in the anniversary suites or whatever it is. Something like, yeah, we got the Taj Mahal room. <laughs> Very nice. That JD didn't want to come, she wanted to stay there. But anyway, um, Stu, you should be very honored and proud. I know Steve uh, told me that uh, this was a big deal for him and they'd send invitations to the top lawyers, doctors, religious people, uh, basically all the community leaders in, the, in Logan and the area. And unfortunately, none of them were able to make it, but uh, <laughs> you should feel good about that. I wanted to kick this off, I really did. There's been some nice things said, but I wanted to kick mine off by giving it to some nice compliments uh, as well. Uh, but I couldn't think of any, so I'll, <laughs> I'll uh, go on with what I got. I've known Stu for a long time, as you just heard, uh, back playing in the Gonzaga days when him and Skip were playing there. And I, I owe them both a big thank you. I, uh, I upped my scoring average three or four points every time we played you guys. Um, that was nice. Um, and Skip really told you some good things. He, he knows what it's like to play with Stu. You know, Stu and Nate, you get a kick out of this, he's always talking, sharing the ball, pass the ball. And it was true, you know, Stu, sharing the ball at Gonzaga was pass it to Stu. There was no, no question about that. But it was really nice his senior year there, though. They, they, they had a, they, they stopped the game and they presented him the game ball. Uh, it was late in the year, and apparently he'd gotten his first assist. And, uh, <laughs> You know, a lot of people, as, as you've just heard, thought Stu was a, a great competitor, and I've, uh, I've played in a lot of different things and done a lot of things with Stu, but I, I just thought he was psychotic. I really did. I, I, I didn't think the great competitor thing we had, uh, and this would only be for you and I to know this, but we played one-on-one -on -one at Montana once in, once in our lives. I won, and I never played him again. And, uh, bugged him ever since, and he just beat me up if we'd, if we'd have played again. Um, but Stu actually was playing at the perfect time, the, the style of basketball at that time where you could shoot the hook and pass, and it was really the perfect time for him to be playing uh, college basketball, it really was. Uh, the other reason it was perfect, he couldn't have gotten to school with today's academic standards. Uh, they've gotten a lot tougher. Um, but we really did do a lot of things together. I was thinking about it on the way down there, Stu. We played silly basketball, we played softball. And we started a business, Stu and I started a business. Uh, there was some shooting basketball games that we put out in restaurants and bars. And our company we had to get a name was Selmore Promotions. Selvig Moral, Selmore Promotions. And I think we lost our butts on that, but it was, uh, it was fun. Stu did the books and I was, as usual, the guy with the rent, setting them up and all that stuff. Uh, but it was fun. We did a lot of things with Vicky and the kids. Uh, I have boys about Jesse and Alan's age approximately. We did a lot of things together. Um, we had a lot of fun. Um, one of the things, Stu and I had some not so great ideas at times, but we bought an old green camper. Got a real good deal on some old green camper. You know, we were going to take kids camping all the time. Uh, I think we did it twice, maybe. Uh, <laughs> But uh, of course, just like with the Papa shots, Stu, I, I don't know if you know this, but Stu's not a real handyman. Vicki, you probably know him, but he's just not a real handyman. You know, I got to hook the trailer up, and I got to change tires, and I got, you know, we go fishing, and I got to untangle the, the lines. Um, Stu got to drive the car. It's just, that's just the kind of way it was, but uh, we did. I remember one of the camping trips, and it must we, we just took the boys, and, but, but Nicole must have been just old enough, and because I, I think she was raising the fuss, the boys always get to do everything, and why doesn't the girl get to do something? So we took Nicole with, and uh, it was just Stu and I, the boys, and Nicole, and I think Nicole's a little fussy at that age. She must not have been that old, but, uh, you know, 
normal kid, four, so getting a little fussy. And of course, Stu being the conscientious father that he was, uh, was going to show off his parenting skills. We stopped at a little gas station. We bought a bunch of candy. And uh, when she fussed, she got candy. And it uh, made sense to me. I did that with my boys. Um, but he paid the price that night, and that's true. She, she threw up on his chest. Uh, just sleep it by him, and uh, so that wasn't the best parenting uh, idea. Um, but uh, anyway, I just had a lot of great memories thinking of the things we, we did, and Stu and I, uh, you know, we talked about everything over those years, uh, all the, the sports we played together in and competed in and golfed and uh, talked a lot to each other. We both had, uh, we both had uh, pretty high maintenance wives, and we talked about that. Uh, <laughs> And, anyway. But I, you know, we, we just got to be great friends, still still are today, and I, I literally cried uh, the day Stu left Missoula. Uh, he owed me $200. And, uh, but I'll tell you a few things maybe about Stu, uh, since we did spend a lot of time that you, you might not know about. It hasn't been easy for Vicky, truth be told. Um, and I don't know if you know, but they're, they're wonderful people. They've had, I don't know how many foster kids now. Last I heard was 40 some, and you've, you've probably had more, but what, what a wonderful thing they've, they've done. And, and Vicki doesn't ask much, but you know, I think about the 25th one, she asked Stu, maybe could you change a diaper? <laughs> and uh, Stu says, well, I'm busy, but I'll, I'll, change, I'll do the next one. And uh, three or four days later, and Vicki's getting a little upset. Uh, I thought you said change the next one. I didn't mean the next diaper, I meant the next kid, he said. <laughs> so. Stu gets pretty consumed with his job, I suppose, as, as all coaches do. And uh, Stu told me, he said, you know, he, Vicky thinks I put basketball before our marriage, even though we just celebrated our 31st season together. <laughs> the time they didn't, they had a big argument, you know, we all have arguments, husbands and wives, and hadn't talked to each other for days. Finally, after a few days, uh, Stu asked her, could you get me one of my nice dress shirts? And she said, oh, so now you're speaking to me. And Stu kind of was confused. He says, well, what are you talking about? And she, she said, well, haven't you noticed I haven't spoken to you for three days? Stu said, no, I just thought we were getting along. <laughs> And then at their 31st wedding anniversary at the party, everybody wanted to know how they, you know, how'd you guys stay together so long or married so long and got along so well. And Stu said when we were first married, we came to an agreement. I would make all the major decisions. Vicky would make all the minor decisions. And in 31 years, we've never needed to make a major decision. <laughs> it worked out pretty well. Actually, early on, and he's telling me because, you know, Skip's right, that's a heck of a couple, and it was a wonderful thing, and the, 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 it's been great. But uh, Stu told me he let Vicky know who the boss was early on. He looked right in the eye and he said, You're the boss. <laughs> so, it's a little tougher though now, Stu. I know we're both getting older, and uh, I know it's hard for you to imagine, but Stu was a pretty good athlete in his day, and you saw some pictures, it proves it. But uh, things don't go, we aren't moving around quite as well, Stu's not moving around quite as well. And I got into town, and you mentioned he likes ice cream. Well, one of the things we used to do in Missoula, we'd head down to the ice cream parlor and have ice cream a lot. And uh, I got in town early enough today and headed down to Stu, took me down to the shop, and we went in there, and Stu kind of, like I said, not walking, kind of gimped up, and got up on the stool, and doesn't walk quite as good as he used to, and uh, the, he ordered a banana split. And uh, the waitress said, crush nuts? And he said, no, arthritis. <laughs> and then, you know, we gotta go to the doctor all the time now, and it's his last physical, the nurse told him to strip to the waist, so he took his pants off. <laughs> he, he's not getting it. Vicky, though, she, at least at least Stu's still romantic, she said. Just the other night he wanted to dress up in a, nurse, in a nurse's uniform at bedtime. And, uh, you know, 
She said, well, why? Is that a fantasy of yours? He said, no, I just want to know we have health care. <laughs> Stu's working on it, though, staying in shape. We used to do all kinds of things. We ran uh, half marathons and all that stuff, but we talked a lot on the phone, and he called me the other day. He says, I got, came up with this great workout thing. It's really, it's really working, and uh, it's a great way to be in shape. He says, you just need to give yourself a little room. Because I'm thinking, okay, I got to do this because about all I can do is bike. I got bad knees. He says, you take two potato sacks, five pound potato sacks, and you hold them out, hold them out, see if you can make it for a minute. Give yourself lots of room. Extend your arms and, and see if you can make it for a minute. Try that for every day. He said, and once you can do that a little bit longer, go ahead, get a 10 pound sack, hold it out. And he says, eventually 50. And up to 100, he said, I'm up to the 100 pounds sack now. And says, and then after you feel, start feeling confident, put a potato in each sack. <laughs> so he has some good ideas for staying in shape. Uh, I don't know how to tell this, but Stu's a pretty studly looking guy. You saw pictures and he is now, but he was not a good looking baby. Uh, I just know that for a fact. I mean, his mom didn't have morning sickness till after he was born. <laughs> Just, just was. And then his mom told me the one where when he was just when he was a baby and she took the bus downtown and got on the bus carrying Stu and the, uh, walks by and the driver says, man, that's an ugly baby. And she goes and sits down and she's thinking about it and she's getting her temper up. She says the guy next to her, he says, boy, that driver really insulted me. And the man said, well, go right up there and tell him off. I'll, just, I'll hold your monkey. <laughs> That's not a good one. Um, but it was fun watching Stu start out and coaching. Uh, you know, as assistant Montana and then the head coach, I admire what he's done. Uh, and it was alluded to, Stu does not take any crap, really. He, he, he started his coaching that way. I mean, his first year at Montana, he got reprimanded by the league for saying, I'm not allowed to comment on the lousy officiating. You know, right, well, that's a no-brainer. You get a, a suspension. And the reporter asked him, why do you say things like that? Is it ignorance or apathy? Stu said, I don't know, and I don't care. <laughs> I've actually seen Stu, and this is true, at Montana go into the stands after a Hector. I mean, I've seen him go into the stands after a Hector. I, I, I've watched a lot of Utah State games on, on, on TV and stuff. I think he's calmed down some uh, for Montana. But he just didn't, he, he's a good way of confirming that stuff. He doesn't take a lot of guff. And I, I don't know if it's like it here, but Montana, there's a lot of pressure. And they think not only you should win every game, but you've got to win it by quite a few points. And besides that, everybody gives you advice. Uh, Stu told me one of the best, thing he, best things he ever did in coaching was quit, quit writing back to anonymous letters. It just it really helped him out. <laughs> And, but we had this thing called Grizzly Den at Montana, where uh, we'd have to go talk to all the boosters every week, and, and they'd uh, lots of advice and all this. And Stu just said one day, he says, I'm going to tell you guys a little story. He said, this is a story about an old man and a young boy and a mule. They're walking through the countryside, and the little boy's leading the mule, and the old man's riding it. And they go through a town, and they overhear the townspeople say, isn't that awful? That poor boy has to walk, the old man's riding the mule. And so they think that's probably not right, so they switch. The little boy's riding the mule, and the old man's walking. And they go through that little town, and they over to the town and that's awful. Old man has to walk, and the young boy gets to ride the mule. They say, that's probably not right, so they both got on the mule. And of course, the next little group they go by says, isn't that awful, that poor mule? Both riding the mule. So they finally both get off, and they're leaving the mule. Of course, it jerks away and jumps in a river and gets swept away forever. And the uh, moral of the story is, if you try and li listen to everybody, you're going to lose your ass. <laughs> you just can't do it. Um. And uh, I'm happy for Stu. You know, he's, uh, he's made a lot of money now. Um, deserves it. I mean, uh, he's worked hard, and he's, he's made the big time. Um, the only thing he really doesn't like anymore about coaching, he loves everything, but all the travels kind of wearing him out. And uh, with his lifestyle and the money he has now, he, the only thing he really misses is spending more time with his chauffeur and his butler. Uh, he's gone too much. Uh, but actually, I'm glad I could use that $200 now, by the way. Um, 
But Stu's won, I, I looked, he's 75% of his games here at Utah State. Uh, he's won everywhere he's gone. Um, he is in the elite coaches in this country, and I don't know if all of you people here realize that, but if you talk to coaches around this country, uh, he's, a, he's in, in the elite class. I, I think there's no one better than him. It's amazing to me what he's done. He does it the right way. He does it with good kids. Um, he even won a lot of games with Randy Ray as an assistant, if I recall. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm pretty proud of him. Um, I, I think you're, you're, you're lucky and blessed uh, to have him here and the fact that he's uh, been here this long. Um, probably more important than that, I think you're very fortunate in life if you have a handful of people you call great friends, real friends, true friends, and they're friends for a long time. And I'm, I'm honored to call Stu my friend. And uh, we miss you in Missoula. Thank you. Our next uh, presenter needs no introduction to this crowd. He grew up here, he, uh, he uh, played high school ball and he played college ball and all you have to say is Nate Harris. this mic on because rumor is uh, word's gotten around that uh, some impersonations are going to be going down here in a minute. And, <laughs> and they are. They are. Uh, one more round of applause for Roger. I've known Roger for a long time for what he does here. Where's, where's Roger? Everything looks good, Roger. Only one, one problem. You did a disservice. Um, I don't think Coach Ray's going to be able to see over this podium. <laughs> We've got a bench for him, but anyway. Um, hopefully tonight I can uh, kind of give a perspective from a player's point of view. Um, I know we've got some former coaches and friends here. And as players get to see him in the impatient moments, a lot, a lot. Okay, so when I first got the phone call from Steve a few months ago, uh, and he told me that they're going to do a fundraiser and we're going to roast Coach Morrill. My first thought was, Coach will never do that. <laughs> Second thought, uh, after I found out that he'd already agreed to do it, I said, well, there's no way I'm going to do that. <laughs> and contrary to what you said, I called a lot of former teammates and kind of told them what we were doing. We're going to roast Coach Morrill. And I got a lot of responses like, um, let's see, um, are, are, you, are you crazy? <laughs> or I can never do that. And then my favorite was, and I quote, because, oh man, you've got bigger stones than me, because I'm still, I'm still terrified of Coach Moore. And I wish he was here. That was John Neal, by the way. But, um, but I realized that during my time at Utah State, um, I spent a lot of time poking fun at Coach Morrill, the coaching staff, roasting him, if you will. Um, it was just never to his face. So, <laughs> So to do, this, to do this tonight might be a little difficult, but we'll make it happen. Um, so, like I said, what I'm going to do tonight is kind of give a player's perspective, um, but I'm a big believer in what happens in the locker room and within the confines of Utah State basketball should stay in the locker room. So I'm not going to be able to give you full access, uh, but I'm going to give you a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and with that being said, I was told many times I've got to keep this PG, okay, PG rated. Now, spend a lot of time on the practice floor with the coach, that's going to be hard to do, all right? <laughs> so, uh, in order to do that, I might, I brought some, some props, all right? And in case I come across some situations where need be, I've got some censoring air horns, okay? <laughs> Two, uh, well, I've got a couple more. <laughs> yeah. That should be enough. All right. 
So every year uh, before the season starts, Coach Morrill has a speech he gives the players about the first second week of practice, and he tells us, he says, fellas, I'm, uh, I'm going to clean up my language this year. I'm going to get better this year than I was last year. I'm not going to curse as much on the floor. And uh, one particularly, particular year, I believe it was my senior year, um, about the first or second week of practice, and we're preparing for EA Sports or EA Miller, Blue Ribbon Beef, one, one of those games. Uh, we're in the team room getting ready to watch some film, and he goes over this speech. I'm not going to cuss as much, going to work on my work on my uh, language, and uh, that lasted about three minutes. Because um, when we got to the back row to turn the film room on, the camera on, the uh, remote control would not work. And he, uh, he looks at Coach Durie and he says, Coach Durie, isn't this, isn't this <laughs> remote supposed to work? Now, Coach Durie. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Okay. No more air horns, I promise. Maybe just one. We'll see. Uh, anyway, Coach Durie was great. Stayed calm and said, Coach, uh, I promise you, I switched the batteries. They're brand new this morning. Don't worry about it. And if the remote control wasn't broke, it was now because his way of fixing it was going smacking around. Cass Mateus had to go up and uh, flip a switch on the, the video input or something, and uh, we were off, off and running. Um, now, I haven't confirmed this yet, but I'm pretty sure that uh, Coach Morrill is in the Guinness Book of World Records for having the largest hands in the world. <laughs> and uh, your clap story, if you ever seen clap on the sidelines, you'll see just how big these hands and fingers really are, okay? In fact, one of my very first memories of Coach Morrill was my first handshake with him. So imagine a 17-year-old high school recruit. We had just finished a team, USU camp, and uh, I was invited with my parents up to his office for a little mini recruiting visit. And so I walk in, and the first thing, first thing I see, Coach Morrill, okay, and then Coach Ray. <laughs> So it's already got a bit of a little, little freak show feel to it. It's kind of like, you know, I'm thinking, are these guys recruiting me to play basketball, or am I kind of the next tall guy in the, the circus out here? I don't, I don't know, but uh, regardless, 30 minutes later, believe it or not, they had me, I verbally committed 20 minutes later, I was your easiest recruit in the history of Utah State basketball. and. Uh, and then I was, I was officially an Aggie 20 minutes later, so good work. <laughs> um, now playing for Coach Morrill, I quickly learned that as long as you're able to follow directions on the court and off the court for that matter, but mainly on the court, practice for and games, follow directions, and just stay away from doing something really, really stupid, and you'll be just fine. The problem is, us players, um, we don't always follow directions, and more often than not, we do really, really stupid things that probably warrant some of the angry moments that we've all seen on the sidelines. Uh, so unfortunately, most people see Coach Morrill under these you know, times of duress when he's angry at us players, and he gets you know, labeled as an angry robot with no heart and everything like that. <laughs> I'm here to tell you he's not. He's an actual human being. He has real feelings. And, uh, he, he's an actual person. Uh, now he's also the only person I've ever known that he has a facial expression, but he combines about five to eight, depending on the moment, different expressions or, or um, yeah, expressions, if you will, into one. So, and you start with a little bit of anger, okay, and he gets, he gets kind of mad. And then he kind of looks confused. So he's angry and he's confused. Then he get a little bewilderment, like, what did he just do? <laughs> and then you add a little more anger. So anger's got to stay there, OK? And then some intensity. You add a scowl, OK? A little bit of a shoulder shrug. The hands come up, and all of a sudden it's like, jeez. And you just look like, what? What is going on? Now as a player, 
when this look comes out, that means one thing, and that's not good. Okay? And uh, get, brace yourselves for an eruption, all right? Um, so what I want to do to kind of wrap things up is just kind of share a few moments during my time when this space kind of showed up and um, maybe some other vulnerable times in, that Coach Morrill has, has uh, had uh, while I was playing. Uh, first one I'm going to tell is during practice one year, you heard about uh, the play cards that get held up all the time. Well, with each play card and each play call, you have hand signals, okay? So one day we're getting used to uh, running through plays, looking at the hand signals. Coach Merle's giving the hand signals. And uh, remember the big hands, big fingers, okay? And we had a certain play called post four, post five. Okay, same play, just post fours ran one way, post fives ran the other way. So we get started and he calls out and this hand signal was post four, okay, and post five. Very simple. You would think, very simple. Um, as we keep going on, we notice after about four or five times running it, half the team's running post four, half the team's running post five, we don't know what's going on. He's obviously starting to get a little angry, he's got the field rule in the face. <laughs> And, and we're thinking, gosh, what's going on? I, I can't figure out what's going on. And pretty soon I realized I can't distinguish between the four and the five. So when his hand comes up, he was calling post four and post five. <laughs> now, if anybody didn't see that, it's four to five. Okay? <laughs> Very hard to distinguish. He finally turns around and looks at everybody, and, and we, we, I, I, think I, I think he actually looked at me, and I told him, I said, look, we're having a hard time distinguishing him. And uh, so then a little humor came out in Coach Morrill, and he next play call, he says, post four <laughs> and post five. <laughs> and he was very clear uh, the rest of the practice. Um, and if you also notice when he calls out plays, you know, you have dribble left, Probably one of the most famous plays Coach Morrill's come up with. He was the founder of that play, right? Also probably responsible for about 50% of my career points. We came from that one single play, so again, good job on that. <laughs> thank, thank you for that. Um, but if you'll notice, he doesn't want the opposing bench to see the play calls. You know, especially if they're playing you know, Coach Ray's on the other sideline. He's very familiar, Coach Berlin. And so you, this opposing bench is over there, and trying to call uh, call the play call over this way and he'll give a little turn and dribble. <laughs> quick, quick, quick dribble right or quick dribble left. As, as fast as he can and he tries to hide him that way. Um, the other thing I love is nobody was exempt from, you know, kind of, you know, the practice is very intense times, everybody's kind of on edge and sometimes even managers, trainers, whoever it might be. Well, uh, my younger brother, who happens to be here tonight, Andy, he, um, he was a manager for a little while. And I don't know if Coach remembers this day or not, but Andy sure did, and he called me the day it happened and told me, uh, told me the story, so I thought I'd share it. Um, they were running through some zone, zone defensive drills, and for the scout team, you have to have you know, seven players come on the floor, two stand in the post, five around the perimeter, you kick the ball around, and uh, the zone gets in position. And they were short on a player that particular day. I think it was Coach Dury. He says, hey, Andy, I need you to uh, step in here. All you got to do is stand on the post. They're going to pass the ball around the perimeter. They're going to kick it into you, catch it, pass it back out. It'll be easy. You'll have, you'll have no problems. And uh, so Andy goes, OK. And you can imagine you know, Andy's out there. And it's kind of first week on the job. I think it was his first year. And he's, he's kind of bouncing around. Andy's kind of a hyper kid anyway. And, and uh, he's sitting on the block. And the ball whips around. It comes in the post. He kicks it back out. And it's perfect. They go through it two or three times, and all of a sudden the whistle blows. And uh, Coach Morrill says, Coach D, what, what, are we, what are we doing? And Coach goes there, he says, what do you mean? He says, is this the biggest son we can find? <laughs> no offense to you, Andy, but I think uh, Nevada's going to have some bigger post guys than that. Can we get a look here? <laughs> uh, and then possibly my, my, my favorite moment. Uh, well, believe it or not, was when Coach Morrill would drop his practice plan. And uh, so 
well, you know, during the course of a practice, of course, one of those practice plans out, well, it might slip to the ground, right? Now, this coach moral <laughs> wouldn't have a problem getting the paper off the ground, right? <laughs> And so now Coach Moore's getting older, he's not as flexible. And uh, so when he picks up the, the practice plan, it goes well something like this. And I'll come over there in a minute, don't worry, I'll make you miss it. But he has to kind of bend this way, like kind of kicks it out. <laughs> so we're going to bring this in the And you get those fingers. Everybody, everybody catch that? Everybody get, everybody get a good look at that? I still can't believe I did this, but. <laughs> okay. Oh, so I've got about 25 of these stories that I'd love to tell, but uh, we don't have that much time. Um, okay. This is probably my second all time favorite story. My first one, I cannot repeat, so I won't. Okay, so stick with me here. We're again in practice going through a drill, and what we're trying to accomplish in this drill was getting your hand up, changing the shot on a closeout, okay? Very simple, you have a guy standing in the middle of the key, you've got one guy with the basketball, and the guy you're guarding on the other side, your job is to stand in pistols, look straight ahead, see man, see ball, both of them, skip pass goes, all you gotta do is turn, close out with your weight back on balance, reach up, change the shot. We had one particular player that had a very hard time with this, and he wanted to go close out, he would, the shot would go up, and he'd never get his hand up. Well, after four or five times of this, here comes the... <laughs> he's starting to get angry. And then this happened a few times I can remember, but it happened this day. Coach Morrill becomes a demonstrator, and he's going to show everybody how this drill's supposed to work. So he gets in the middle of the key, and he's, he's in pistols, and he's gritting his face, and he's showing his intensity. And his pistols kind of come out this way a little bit. But that's okay, because his finger's like shotgun barrel, so it's more you know, pistols this way. But, and he's going side to side, and he's, he's looking. He summons one of the managers over to be the skip passer, all right? So he's in pistols, and he tells the manager to throw a skip pass, and he fires it across court. It's supposed to be kind of a pass over the defense, and he fires it across court. And by the time Coach can even turn his head, he shot it, swished. <laughs> And obviously the drill had no purpose. <laughs> and he looks at his manager and he says, I didn't tell you to throw a Nolan Ryan fastball across the court. Throw a skip pass across so, I can, so we can close out. So anyway, he gets back in there and he's doing it. He's been pistols, same thing. Ball's in the corner, skip pass goes, Coach Warren goes over, close out, hand up. It was flawless. It looked really good. And uh, he's trying to explain to this player who was having trouble with the drill, he said, hey, it's not that hard. You close out, you gotta, get, you gotta get a hand up. Don't be sitting down here with your hand down here. You were guarding the ball. You're not guarding his junk. <laughs> I'm about in tears laughing at this point. The rest of my practice was out the window because I was completely useless. Now, we would often do these kind of, you know, imitate Coach Morrill and other coaches for that matter. Not quite often, but sometimes coach. <laughs> and I thought that he never knew that, that we did this. And again, I don't know if you remember this day or not, but back before all this new team room and uh, training room was built, the training room was right next door to the, uh, the coach's office, the coach's room downstairs in the spectrum. And we had just got done with a brutal practice with, you know, conditioning day, uh, running a lot. It wasn't a very good day for us. Everybody's kind of, their daubers down a little bit. And oftentimes, believe it or not, sessions like this would help lift the spirits of players, especially new ones, to kind of, you know, have some fun with them, make sure they were still staying engaged. And uh, so this particular day, 
I'm kind of the ringleader of this thing at this point, and I'm in mid-season form. I'm picking up practice plans, and I'm <laughs> facial expression. And... <laughs> we got Mike William, the trainer. He's in there laughing, and uh, we're all having a great time, I thought. And then all of a sudden, Coach Morrill's head comes whipping around the door and looks in there, and I freeze. <laughs> and he looks at me and says, don't think for a second I can't hear you through that wall. <laughs> And then I'm terrified, like, he's going to kill me. And as he, walks, as he walks down the hallway, he says, don't think we don't make fun of you either, Harris. <laughs> so apparently they have their own little session as well. Uh, okay, one more story. December 23rd, 2004, the Cougars are in town. So it's right before Christmas break. And... Uh, it was a game for you remember, we're up by like 20 or 30 in the first half, we're killing them. We slowly give away the lead, comes down to Spencer Nelson hits a shot with two seconds to go, we win by two. And I remember thinking that whole, whole game, I mean, if we lose this, we're gonna practice on Christmas Day. <laughs> and after the game, uh, Vicky comes up and gives me a hug. Now she oftentimes did this and congratulated on, on a good game, but this particular night, she gave me a really big hug, and I kind of sat back and said, oh, thank you. And she looks at me right in the eyes and she says, we are gonna have such a better Christmas this year. <laughs> and I agree, because we wouldn't practice it on Christmas Day. Uh, no, but in all honesty, um, Coach Morrill is obviously very good. Uh, well, first, uh, one more note before I get there. Let's give Victor a round of applause for being married to him. Right? No, but Coach Morrill is very good at what he does. Um, I'm very grateful to have spent five years um, under him. He's the most competitive, most com intense person that I've ever known. And um, I'll tell you this, he pushed me to be a better player and a better person every day. Every day that I was under him, every day in the practice. Uh, taught me a lot of life lessons that, uh, that I do appreciate to this day. And uh, probably the biggest lesson I took from Coach Morrill is that whatever you're doing in life, if you want to succeed, you better be prepared, okay? You better be willing to put in the time, put in not only the hard work, but the dirty work, okay? Which is why his teams always want to defend and rebound, and that's dirty work. Nobody wants to do that. That's why we win games. And lastly, just fight, scratch, and claw for everything that you want in life and uh, you'll be okay. He'd, he'd often remind us of this uh, when he'd say, well, what do you guys think you're on, a, a country club scholarship? <laughs> so, thanks, Coach. I think we lost something here. Translation. There we go. I don't know how that works. That's okay. You tired yet? I hope we're having fun. It's past 8.30. Well, at your age, you know. Uh, the next coach we love, Randy Ray, is a part of our family, except one night a year, and we hope he fails miserably. But. Uh, I just wanted to let Randy know that purple is Roger's favorite color. The colors of Cache Valley for Hope are purple. This is not a Weber State event with the purple napkins and everything. You know, coaches are weird and they have strange traditions and they have things they do and some of that gets passed on to other coaches. And I don't know where the flashcard thing started. Coach Montgomery maybe? I don't know who started. Oh, clear back to Coach uh, Judd. So, anyway, next we'll have. <laughs> this is really scary. Can you see me all right? I swear to God, when I do these things, the biggest fear is that podium better be small. I, I know I'm a mini me, boo boo, all that kind of stuff. But before I get going, Skip was telling the story about, okay? 
So seriously, we're at the Colorado State basketball camp. Coach is running the camp. I'm running the camp, and coach is there. And we decide we're going to have a player versus coaches basketball game. One night, we're going to try to pick the best players at camp, and the coaching staff, Coach Morrill included, we're going to go play against them. All right? Coach is competitive. I don't know how old you were at the time, Coach. But So anyway, we get the game. We get the ball. I'm the point guard. So I'm bringing it down, and Coach Morrill is going to...
But, uh, you know, Coach, Coach is, uh, there's a lot of great qualities, but one of the greatest qualities is a terrific family man, uh, loves his family. Um, when the kids were growing up, he was going to make sure he got to all the events that they were doing. Um, playing basketball, Jesse Allen, you know, Tiffany, everybody, Nicole. But, uh, uh, but you know, and I figured this out when I have kids too, and I got a 14 year old and 11 year old. And when you have kids, it's a great way to get out of stuff, you know. Uh, to this day, I'll do it myself, you know. Hey, there's a function at 6 30, and uh, I'll be asked to go do something. God, I can't, you know. My, my kid's got a double header tonight. I got to, you know, I got to see. And nobody's going to argue with that, right? Hey, he's going to go see his kids. That's great. Well, I go home and sit on the couch. Uh, <laughs> Coach was the master, okay? Uh, we would, we'd be finished in practice, and so we'd say, hey, Coach, we're going to go to Salt Lake to watch a kid. Why don't you come down and, and watch his kid with us? And Coach, he works really, really hard. I'm sorry, has anybody ever been around? But when it's time for downtime, he enjoys his downtime, as he should. He's earned it. So we're getting home practice, and he's like, ah, oh, God, we can't, I can't go to Salt Lake. Tiffany's got a volleyball game tonight. So, oh, okay, well, I understand that. Okay, next night, um, hey, Coach, uh, there's another game being played. Let's go to Salt Lake Community College, catch a kid. Dang it, Tiffany's got a volleyball game. Gosh, dang it. Uh, okay, so she's playing back-to-back -back nights. Okay. <laughs> uh, hey, Coach, you got a radio show tonight. Hey, cover for me. You take it. Tiffany's got a volleyball game tonight. All right, so Sunday afternoon, we just finished practice. Hey, Coach, can you make a couple of recruiting calls for me? No, nah, I would, but Tiffany's got a volleyball game this afternoon. <laughs> Sunday, Coach? Yeah, it's a tournament. Yeah, it's a tournament. Or well, we figured out, adding it up, Tiffany must have played like a 90-game schedule <laughs> for junior year in high school because he was in Tiffany's game so much. But, uh, but and I use it to this day, Coach. I've learned everything I do is because of you. And that's one of the things I really learned. I use my kids to get myself in the <laughs> but, coach, uh, but Coach hired me. You know, coach is very blunt. I think Vicky's always said that Coach is one of his best attributes is he's just, he's totally blunt and honest. And one of his worst attributes is he's totally blunt and honest. Well, I found that out the day that he hired me at Colorado State. I was looking for a job. I was, I was scrambling around. I was working at Denver University as a volunteer, and I was working at Colorado State's basketball camps for Boyd Grant, who was a friend of mine and a good friend of Coach Morrow's. Coach Morrow gets the job at Colorado State. So Coach Grant comes to me, and I'm working at Coach Grant's basketball camps as Stu gets into town, and he needs to hire, excuse me, hire some assistant coach. Coach Grant comes and says, hey, we need to get you on Coach Morrow's staff. I, I said, yeah, that'd be great. I don't know Coach Morrow from Adam. He doesn't know me. He says, well, I'm going to work for Adam to Adam. Coach Morrow's going up, and I think he talked to you a couple times, Coach. And uh, Anyway, long story short, Coach came to camp when I was doing a drill with some players and watching me, and he couldn't see me because I'm so damn short that we had our campers. Our campers were bigger than me when he came down to see me, and that wasn't a good sign. He needs a coach probably bigger than the campers. But uh, anyway, so, long story short, I go, to, I go out to eat lunch with Skipper. Remember that Skipper? We go to lunch, and, and I'm nervous, and you know, I hope I don't screw up too bad. But I think it was a couple days later, Coach Morrow finally called me up into his office. And uh, he says, all right, here's the deal. Coach Grant's been telling me about you, whatever, whatever, whatever. Uh, here's four game tapes. I want you to take these four game tapes home tonight, and I want you to break them down so I can see if you know what the hell you're doing. So I'm like, yeah, and the Montana game tapes where he came from, it, and it was like, I don't know, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So I'm fired up, I'm living with my wife, uh, we weren't married, we're living together, okay, I'm sorry, but we did, uh, <laughs> what the hell, I'm 53 now, it don't matter. Uh, but, so I get these four game tapes, and I, I gotta make my, I got rulers out, I'm diagramming these, these, these courts, and if there's a little line, if I have to race up, I start over, and I'm doing the whole, and I watch these game tapes, and I get started about four in the afternoon, and I literally finished it by the next morning. And I wrote down every possible thing. This is my one chance. If I don't get this job, I'm probably going to be a high school coach in a small town in Colorado. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I would have been fine. But if I don't get this job, I'm probably toast. I'm probably out of college basketball, no chance. So I'm working. 
And I write down every little thing, out of bounds plays, set plays, side out of bounds plays, defenses, I got it all down. Five in the morning, I go to Kiko's. They stay open 24 hours. I go on and I put them in these really nice plastic things so they look professional and I, you know, then I go to sleep for a couple hours, I didn't really sleep and I get up and I take a shower and I look nice and I'm going to meet Coach Ed. I, don't even, I think it was 9 o'clock we are going to meet and I'm there at 8.30 and I'm sitting there and I can't wait. I'm nervous. All right? So Coach walks in, you know, he, you know, he gives me the front of the head, come on back here. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's not a great sign. He doesn't even know my name, I don't think. Um, so anyway, I get back there and I got my stuff and the film. He says, give me those tapes. So I gave him the tapes and uh, he said, let me, let me look at that stuff. What'd you do? So I showed it to him and I'm thinking, oh man, this is gonna, this is gonna knock his socks off. This is so good. Um, he does this, he sits on his chair, he kind of takes about one, two, three, takes all that, throws in the garbage. And I'm like, I just worked 12 hours on that deal. First of all, I said, and I kind of looked, I said, Coach, can I have that back? I want to keep it. He said, nah, I don't worry about that. So then he kind of looks at me, he gives me this stern look. And I figured we're going to get through some interview questions. You know, what's your philosophy? What do you think your strength is? What's your weaknesses? All this kind of stuff. And I practiced it all night long. You, there's nothing you can throw at me that I can't handle. Except this. He says to me, looks me around the eye and says, do you have a Napoleon's complex? <laughs> I was stunned. Uh, he kind of threw me back. And, and to be honest, I'm just a farm boy from Iowa. I'm not very smart. And I grew up with pigs and cows and stuff, so I'm not very worldly. I never heard of Napoleon's comments. So I said, I said, Coach, I didn't know what to say. I said, no, Coach, uh, I don't think I do. I said, I feel fine. <laughs> And I says, and I promise, I'll go get a physical if I need to. <laughs> and he just kind of shook his head. I think he realized he wasn't dealing with somebody very bright. And he eventually felt sorry for me and hired me. So that's the bluntness from, from Coach Ball. Uh, Coach Ball's an old school guy. We all know that. And that's what I love about him. Uh, Image is not his deal. We all know that. Uh, coach could care less about what he wears, how he dresses. You know, today's world of college basketball, it's all about these slick guys. Coach calls them red hats, and I can't stand them to this day myself. I got way too many bolts of Coach Morrow. I think like them, I talk like them. I got the same manner as the closest one coach like this. I do it, I do it. But, we got these red hots in the business. It's all about image and wearing the thousand dollar suits and slicking back the hair, self promoting Everybody has an agent. The tweeting, what the hell's the tweeting crap? We got people tweeting at half times and practices. It's all self promotion. It's garbage. All right. Well, obviously we can't ever accuse Coach of being a self promoting image guy. All right. Now, Coach, Coach doesn't care about dressing the part or looking the part. And every once in a while, we had this, you know, when I was with him, we kind of, you know, his suits were, you know, just okay, that's all right. But we kind of, every once in a while, said, Coach, let's go get some new stuff. Go get a new suit, suit too, okay? Ah, I man, I just cost my eye to get a new suit, a new suit. But, uh, uh, so one day, I think he went down and bought some suits. He came back in and I looked at it. He didn't want to spend money. Coach is really good with his money. He's taught me how to be good with his money. You know, one thing that always scared us was before camp, if coach went to Wendover or Mesquite before camp uh, and didn't do very well, we knew our camp tricks were going to be as big. So when he went to Wendover or Mesquite, we were just, we were saying prayers that he'd do okay so we'd get the money. But, uh, but we actually thought at one time that when he did pick up his stuff that he went and was shopping at Desert Industries. I don't think he did, but that was a rumor. And that was actually from Don Burrow, Coach. That's not from me. So you can play it in. I would never say something like that. Right? That's on me. The other thing that I love about Coach is uh, he carried these, do you still carry those small cones, Coach? Do you remember those black little cones that you used to have? Yeah. Well, let me show you. I got, I got some. Remember these things? <laughs> Anybody carry these anymore? 
these coaches scared me. And I was scared when I was a kid. I think coach, uh, coach probably still got some real big in the bathroom. That's okay. But uh, these things were like gold. We go on a road trip, and I specifically remember two or three times we're at Irvine. I don't know if you remember this coach, but we played Irvine and we won, and we go in the locker room and celebration. Everything's good. And uh, anyway, he's got to go talk to the media. So coach would usually get his comb out and comb his hair with these. 10 cent combs, right? They cost about 10 cents. He couldn't find his comb. So he's panicking. And he's, he goes, right, goes, right, I, I can't find my comb. He said, go, go see if you can find my comb. So I'm like, oh gosh. Go, okay, I'll go find it. So I go to the bench. It's, and I'm looking around the bench and I'm thinking to myself, I'm looking around this bench for a 10 cent comb, for God's sake. I go to the bus, I look at the bus, I couldn't find a comb. Same thing happened in Pacific one time. We, we couldn't find I spent more time looking for Coach's comb than I did anything else. So I, did, I bought you some combs, Coach, and I want you to make sure that you still have enough, so I still got you some. I will drop these off to you tonight. <laughs> but that is old school right there, and that's what Coach Morrow's all about. And God bless him, and that's why I love him to death, because he is old school. He doesn't care anything about anything other than coaching his basketball team, loving his family, taking care of the kids as he's coaching, and taking care of his assistants. And, uh, you know, Coach, I would not be here uh, if it wasn't for you. Uh, I have no chance to be here. And every good thing that's happened to me in college basketball and a lot in my life is because of Coach Wong. Uh, I, I, I don't know anything better. When I got to Weaver State, I don't know anything better than to do what Coach Morrill does. I don't do it nearly as well as him, and I'm not near the basketball coach he is, but everything we do in our program is based on what we did. I copy it. That's all I know. Everything from what we run offensively, defensively, to how I try to handle my players, to how I run a program, is everything is based on him. So if we have any success at all, it's really basically because Coach Morrill taught me what to do. But, again, uh, I'm not here, I'm not having, doing, I'm just not in college basketball if it wasn't for Coach Wong. And Coach, you're my mentor, you're a great friend, and more importantly, your family. And Vicki, uh, all these great things that happened to Coach, I think all of us know that he wouldn't have accomplished these things without you by his side, you're a rock. Uh, Coach is a very intimidating guy, he's big, he can bark, he can yell. But he is the most compassionate, gentle, kind, loyal, honest person I have ever met. And some of you guys don't get to see that. I wish that you would. But uh, Coach Wall, thank you for everything. I appreciate it. Uh, for me and my family. And I wish Laura could be here uh, to thank you as well. But I appreciate it. Something, 
You know, some coaches go their entire career and never have anything like this. Those are the lucky ones, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, what about Steve Edwards? Uh, you know, he told me he was going to MC it. Didn't know what to think about that. Uh, you know, I didn't know how much Steve would insult me. Uh, but, you know, one thing you should know about Steve, though, is did you enjoy the dinner? Good dinner? <laughs> Steve, uh, Steve wanted Cajun food. Just, you know, we had to talk about it. He wanted Cajun food because, uh, you know, at his age, he likes to know some of his parts can still get hot. <laughs> School of Education, and hey, Dick Mata, longtime Weaver coach, uh, NBA coach, uh, 82 years old, and I respect. I went over and listened to him. I've done that a couple times, and I, Dick's walking up to speak, and I shake his hand and say, "Coach, how you doing?" He says, "Stu, I'm 82 years old. How do you think I'm doing?" <laughs> and I said, "You look great." I said, "You got you dressed up. You got a tie on?" He says, "Yeah, got this tie on." As soon as I put it on, my sphincter got tight. <laughs> he said, I thought I was coaching again. <laughs> but that's the only time I ever wore a tie. Uh, but, you know, the, the program tonight, I really thank uh, these guys for, for doing this program. But I want to tell you that this, that believe it or not, these are my best friends. <laughs> gives you some idea the difficulty I have in making friends. <laughs> I gotta tell you just a little bit about each. I'll try and keep it somewhat short. Uh, Greg Gurley, uh, most of you know him as a longtime Pro High School coach. Won over 500 games, uh, more state championships than anyone in Utah high school basketball state history. Uh, to me, he's my teammate, my friend. Uh, I, we started for three years at Pro High School. Uh, during our sophomore year, he'd ask me after the game sometimes. I didn't say anything. After our junior years, we're going along several times. Who was that woman in the stands yelling, throw the ball to Stewart? <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know. Who is she? <laughs> Senior year. Who is that woman? She's driving me crazy. Throw the ball to Stewart. I'm throwing you the damn ball to what? <laughs> Who is that? I got to tell you, Jerk. That was my mom. <laughs> You know, over 40 years ago, I was best man at Craig and his wife, Robin's wedding. Uh, Robin was here tonight, and Craig were high school sweethearts. Now, he did some digging to find his, his pictures that I didn't know he was bringing out. But fortunately, I did some digging, too. The 1970 Pro High School Yearbook. Here's what Robin wrote to me. <laughs> and I asked Mickey to pay close attention. <laughs> Stu, what an athlete. Sometimes I wish I could be in your shoes, even though they might be a little big. You know this is fact, because this is, sounds like ice for you, right? <laughs> Stu, I am so jealous of all your girlfriends. You've always been around to listen to all my problems. In fact, you go around with my big problem. <laughs> See you this summer, love, Robbie. Robbie, 40 some years later, has it gotten any better? <laughs> uh, you know, Robin, I thought you'd bring out uh, Bo, Robin Selby. I thought you'd bring up uh, our high school song, Craig and I's one of our high school songs. You remember, Bo? We look sharp, we're from Pro High. We feel sharp, we're from Pro We are sharp. Drur, I don't know about you. I don't look sharp. I don't feel so sharp. And it's damn debatable if we are sharp. <laughs> Thanks to Craig for, for being here. Uh, Rob has been the women's basketball coach, Robin Selly. Bo Wicala and Montana for 35 years. You heard that. His record is 798 and 254. Yeah. yeah. 367 in league play. That's, that's 
That's some crazy stuff. 798 wins. So, Bo, are you really about to win your 800? 800 game, you're about to win your 800 game, you must be really old. <laughs> <laughs> As I take a good look at you, Paul, you know, the years have been pretty good to you, but the weeks in between have knocked the hell out of you. <laughs> <laughs> I, mentioned, I mentioned earlier the difficulty I have in making friends. Robin has the same problem. I'm the best friend he has, and I don't like him much. <laughs> really, I don't like him, and I was well. You know, it's, but we were together for 13 years at the University of Montana, and as they say nowadays, the kids always say we're boys. You know, what a weird term. Friends, we're boys, okay? Uh, in 1986, I was named the head coach at the University of Montana. Robin had been the women's coach for eight years, played the legendary Judd Heathcote, and could have taken the men's job. There's no question he could have taken the men's job. Um, he said he wouldn't do that to his players, act like coaching men was better than coaching women. But I think our friendship had a little bit to do with it. My wife, my children, thank you for me having a head coaching job. Appreciate that. Uh, he, you know, he called me up when I came to Utah State and he said, I got a Mormon joke for you. And Craig, you'll remember, I told this joke, and we're going to see if these people laugh, okay? <laughs> I told this joke at the first, I, I, mean, I get the job at Utah State, and I go to the Utah High School Coaches Clinic, and I tell this joke, and not one coach laughs. <laughs> and I said, I said to Drew, I said, what in the world? Nobody's lost you, they thought you were making fun of them. <laughs> and I said, well, I was. <laughs> uh, you know, one of them I was raised in Utah and all of that, but here's a joke. Why do you always take two Mormons with you on a fishing trip? Because if you only take one, he will drink all your beer. Farmers, <laughs> <laughs> right on. Well, that was a joke. <laughs> Skip Molitor, young Zank University teammate and college roommate, plus uh, assistant of mine at Montana and Colorado State, Skipper. I uh, haven't seen Skip as often in the last 15 years. Uh, you know, but he, he looks the same as he did 15 years ago. So does a dollar bill. <laughs> no, Skipper's great. Uh, he's getting older though. The other night his wife Amy said, come upstairs and make love. He said, honey, I can't do both. So. <laughs> Target for a roast. I really have an easy target for a roast. My, my size, height, weight, my age, my profession. But this guy, if you only knew him like I, like I know him. Now there, here's a guy that could be roasted and it would last longer than this marathon. Right? Uh, you know, and there's so many skip stories I can tell. Uh, you know, he's sitting in our brain. You remember we were sitting in our office at Colorado State? Uh, He's, you know, he has a collared shirt on, okay? You know, like you wear the Utah State basketball shirts with the logo and stuff. He's got a car on state. And we're, we're, we're in a meeting, and I'm handing out responsibilities, and, and they're writing down what they need to do. And I look over at Skipper, and his shirt is facing the wrong way. <laughs> a collared shirt. <laughs> the Colorado State basketball is facing inward. <laughs> I said, Skipper, who the hell dressed you this morning? And he looks down and he goes, whoop, whoop. <laughs> sorry, he says, sorry. <laughs> who does that? <laughs> one other one, I gotta tell this one, you know, and, and it, you might not get this one, but it, it, it's just so special. Uh, we were 25 years old. Mike Montgomery got the head job in Montana. I went to work for Mike, I was trying to get into a house. Skip came over to Missoula because he was uh, going to take the Freshtown High School job. And, uh, you know, we, we had nowhere to stay. So we're staying at Mike Montgomery's house. I'm sleeping out on the porch. Skip was sleeping in the living room. You know, as young guys will do, we ran around town a little bit, got late. Uh, I said, I'll see you back at Mike's house. So I get back there, and, you know, I, I, I wait. And I wait. And, you know, I'm going to shoot the breeze with him. He doesn't show. So I go to bed. And I get up in the morning, I'm eating breakfast, he's still not there. I, I'm thinking that's kind of strange. He comes in and he tells me what happened. 
He headed right home. He went into the house, didn't worry about that he couldn't find his blanket or his pillow. <laughs> Lay down on the couch and went to sleep. Took off his clothes. He's in his boxers at about, you know, four in the morning. A 90-year-old guy is standing above him. <laughs> now this gentleman can't hear very well, might be packing a gun, and he says, Skipper's getting up and he's putting on his pants, he's putting on his shirt, and he's like, I'm in the wrong house. <laughs> I'm in the wrong house. And he's putting them on real slow. And the guy finally goes, she's sleeping. <laughs> School guy from Utah, 98% LDS, went to Rick's College, uh, pretty conservative, pretty, you know, I'm not saying it's not exactly liberal, but when I got the gun jack, I thought it was pretty liberal. I met this easy going, long haired, semi rowdy guy that was kind of like nobody I'd ever hung out with, and our friendship kept me there when I was adjusting, and, and uh, our friendship lasted for life. I said, Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to get through this as quick as I can, but I gotta say something about this guy. Nick Harris. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm really proud of him. I mean, he was an unbelievable competitor. You might know that he was the only, he is the only basketball player in Utah State history to be first team all conference as a sophomore, junior, and senior. Really hard to do. Uh, and You know, at this point, he's pretty mature and polished, as you saw. But I have to tell you, he was a little green when we got him out of Skyview High School. Uh, he thought Taco Bell was a Mexican phone company. <laughs> <laughs> he was one of the best learners I've ever had. I remember Coach Ray, I used to tell my sisters all the time, be careful what you tell this kid. Be careful what you tell him, because he's going to try and do it. He listens. He's, he was unbelievably coachable. and. You know, Coach Ray, that was cold what you did to him. That day after practice, Coach Ray, Nate's a freshman, Coach Ray tells him, Nate, if you'll hang on the rim, his arms will get longer and get more rebounds. <laughs> well, I walked through the gym, thank God, about three hours later, <laughs> and got him off the rim. You know? <laughs> Every, everyone thinks Nate's so tough, because that's kind of how we play. Uh, you know, not, not really that tough, but Nate was... First child was born, he was allowed in the delivery room with his wife. The screaming got too bad. The doctor slapped his face and threw him out. <laughs> but I, I was just thinking of you, Nate, driving all the way from California. I mean, that had to be a sight, making all those faces for 16 hours. <laughs> Did that look like you? <laughs> uh, that's a uh, special guy, special player, Nate Harris. Uh, Randy Ray. Randy was with me 13 years as an assistant, uh, one of the closest friends I have in the world, now a very successful coach at Weaver State. And he's right, that story about, I don't think you should ask, ask that in an interview, should you? You have a Napoleon complex? I, you know, I, 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 it's a good thing I hired him, he probably sued and I had to hire him. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Randy gets the short jokes and he gets tired of them. I know he does, but you know when I hired, when I hired him at Colorado State, I told him he, he needed to sue the city of Fort Collins because they built the sidewalks too close to his ass. <laughs> <laughs> I know he gets tired of it, you know. But you can just I get teased about being big, and he's got teased about being short. Uh, we were playing at Utah State, uh, you know, it's a year or two before we came to Utah State. And the student section, they're the best, as you know, they're the best. And hey, they started, you know, I'm up, I'm active, and Randy's one of the most active assistants I've ever had. And they start chanting Yogi and Boo Boo. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a true story. It's a true story. And it was, it was pretty damn funny, you know. I, uh, Tell that story, and I gotta finally tell you why. I've never told you why. 
Guys, here's the thing. Yogi is smarter than the average. <laughs> and Boo Boo is just a little peanut. <laughs> it's, it's a fun story to, to tell. You know, people ask me all the time why I tell you truths when we are recruiting against Weaver State and Coach Ray. I say this, Randy has a lot, had a lot of charisma in his early years, but lately it's cleared up. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I'm still kind of in this crazy world of coaching because I've been blessed with unbelievable assistants over here tonight. The quality I expect above all else is loyalty. Uh, for 13 years, and even now, Randy Ray has my back, gives me credit for things I don't deserve credit for. And that's, that's, that's his loyalty. And I gotta tell you, one time, uh, we were playing Utah, the late Rick Gutierrez was on the sideline. Him and I were going at it. He challenged me to a fight. <laughs> it's kind of one of those he said, she said kind of deals, you know. Uh, and Coach Ray told me, this is a quote. Coach Ray, better than not Coach Ray, says, Coach, I'm pretty sure you could whoop his ass, but if you need me, I'm there. <laughs> Out here and wrap it up with a, with a few thank, thank yous. Uh, uh, first of all, to my family for putting up with me all these years. Uh, people have asked me forever, how in the world did you land that what? How'd you, how'd you land it? I'm a good recruiter. <laughs> uh, you know, Nate Harris, after he insulted me, told you I was a good recruiter. I mean, he insulted the hell out of me and said, then I got it in 20 minutes. What's that? <laughs> 20 minutes, we got it done. That, I mean, he was the easiest one I've ever got. I wish it were all that, that easy. But, uh, you know, my four kids are here, and, and I appreciate that. Uh, you know, they, uh, it's interesting. You know, you, your children grow up, and you try to get them together, and it's hard. You know, it's hard to get them together, but their dad is going to be roasted and they change their schedules. <laughs> These two sisters made it. Uh, appreciate, appreciate that. My sister, my brother, you know, uh, Alan's wife, or grandson Charlie, everybody appreciate you coming. Uh, you know, Steve Edwards and, and Roger Welsh, when they got together and, and told me about this affair, I really didn't feel comfortable for you people paying $100. That's just, you know, that's just me. And, you know, I, I thought, I thought, God, nobody would come. Hundred dollars, you know. And, and uh, they said, I said, let's just charge fifty. And they convinced me that hundred was the right way to go because of your generosity. So we thank you for that. I, I guess I got to tell Steve and Roger what I tell Mickey all the time. I, 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 I guess you were right. <laughs> uh, you know, the Roasters uh, did a great job. Very, very close friends of mine, as you can tell. Thanks to them, it's great to see them. Cash Valley, Valley for Hope Cancer Foundation. Uh, Roger, when I grow up, I want to be like you. I mean, unbelievable, unbelievable. Thank to him and his board and everyone who helped such a great organization. Every family has been affected by cancer. Uh, ours is no different. Uh, we lost my dad to cancer. My sister Tony's had cancer. My brother Gary's had cancer. Obviously, Vicky's had cancer, you've heard that. And so we, we all know uh, what it's like. And any help that any of us can give to cancer, to cancer is, is great, and to this organization is great. So I want to leave you with one toast. I don't have a glass. Will you raise yours? Okay? I ask you to raise your glass, and I'll leave you with this. May we never crack a joke that scratches our friendship. May we always be happy, and our enemies know it. And may we all have the four L's of life. Length of days, loyalty, laughter, and love. Thank you. Good night.
It's been worth it to see this many people join together in a great cause. Uh, the stars aren't necessarily the ones on the podium. The stars are the ones down there who are helping out this cause. We appreciate it. Those families who benefit from it appreciate it. And thank you for coming. Roger has one, not one thing to say. So thank you. <laughs> Have a safe trip home.